Hi, I'm Hayla Victoria and welcome back to my Crime and Policing channel. In today's session, we're continuing our exploration of support that police officers can give to those suffering from um, adverse mental ill health and other things that might prevent them from having capacity to make decisions. And in particular, we are looking at the Mental Capacity Act 2005. Now, this legislation is a decent bit of legislation. This gives um, like a broad legal framework in order to protect vulnerable people who aren't able to make decisions for themselves aged 16 and over. Now then, this act also empowers officers to be able to protect and support people who don't have mental capacity and in particular if you need to restrain somebody uh, under section 5 and if you need to use force which would be section 6 of this act. There's also a really interesting part of the act which is section 4 and that's about people acting on someone else's behalf. Okay, let's get cracking. So what does mental capacity actually mean then? Well, when you've got mental capacity, that means you are able to make decisions for yourself. You can decide when, where, what, how you do everything. But sometimes people don't have mental capacity to make decisions. And this can be because of a number of reasons. It could be like a lifelong um, condition that you have. You might have got a severe learning disability or disability. You may have, um, being injured, so you might have got a brain injury or something like that. It might also be temporarily, so it could be an injury that you recover from. It could be intoxication through narcotics, or alcohol or drug abuse. It could be your unconscious. There are a number of reasons why you might not be able to make a decision at that moment in time. And that's when the Mental Capacity Act comes in, in order to help you be cared for when you don't have the capacity to be able to make the decisions for yourself. There are some things you've got to consider, and that is that just because someone might um, have made a terrible decision before or have not had the capacity to be able to make a good decision, doesn't mean they're not going to be able to make it now. OK, you've got to take that into consideration and you've got to treat people as if they have mental capacity unless it can be proved otherwise. Also, you can't treat somebody as if they're incapable of making a decision unless you've done everything you can, taken all the steps you can in order to help them to understand. And if they don't, then you can ascertain they don't have the capacity to make that decision. You can't base it just on how someone looks, okay? So you can't be like, well, they look like they don't have mental capacity, because they might do. And also because of a condition they may have. You cannot make that assumption. You need to take every step you can to ensure this person understands what you're talking about and that they can make that decision based on all the things that are in front of them. If they cannot make those decisions, then you need to get someone else to help them facilitate that decision making process or to act on their behalf to make a decision for them. So I'm going to look now at Section 4 of the Mental Capacity Act and I'm going to read straight from my favourite, the Blackstone's Policing Handbook for Students 2020. And this is all about um, Section 4 and it says, under Section 4 of the MCA, which is the Mental Capacity Act, the decision made by any subsequent action must be in the person's best interests. They must be encouraged to participate as fully as possible in any act or decision and all reasonably practicable steps should be taken to achieve this. The likelihood of the person having the capacity at some point in the future must be considered and if there is no immediate need to make a particular decision and they're likely to regain the capacity to make that decision, then it should be delayed until they've recovered sufficiently. If the person cannot make decisions and therefore lacks capacity, a decision might need to be made on their behalf. As far as possible, the person's wishes and feelings should be considered, especially their usual beliefs and values, if, if they are known, obviously. The views of the following people should also be taken into account. So that's their carer. Anyone else they would like to be consulted, so they might be asking you to talk to somebody else, talk to my partner, whatever, my dad. Anyone with the power of attorney or deputy appointed by a court. Actions carried out in connection with the care or treatment of a person do not incur any liability. If prior to those acts, reasonable steps were taken to establish that the person lacked capacity and it was reasonably believed that the actions were in the person's best interests. If a decision relates to life sustaining treatment, any consideration that would be better if the person was allowed to die should be avoided. That's quite a serious one, that bit. So if actions are resisted, so despite efforts to communicate and encourage participation, then you, you could use restraint, but it needs to be as minimal as possible. Um, 
and as you know, proportional, and that's under section six of this act. Um, that includes force or threatening to use it in order to apply care or treatment and restrict a person's liberty of movement, whether or not they resist. It does not include depriving a person of their liberty or contravening the decision made by a court or a person with a relevant power of attorney. So it's all quite serious, isn't it? But it's all about the person's best interests. If you are unconscious, someone has to make a decision for you. That's just how it is. Um, if they suspect that you might be coming around soon and you know, it's temporarily, then they might wait until you can make that decision yourself. But somebody with your best interests will make that decision. If you're unable to make the decision at the time. And those decisions that make need to be like the least kind of um, interfering with your normal life as possible and interfering with your rights as little as possible. So we're now going to look at what if somebody is being treated badly who lacks mental capacity and this does happen and it is terrible. Um, so some people have particular caring or legal responsibilities to care for somebody else who lacks mental capacity and they might also have power of attorney so they're the ones that make decisions about everything. Um, you know, your house, your finances, all that kind of stuff. And with that come some bad eggs sometimes. And um, obviously when we find out this stuff like this happening, then we have this legislation to protect those vulnerable people. And we're looking at section 44 of the Mental Capacity Act 2005. And that's where it's an offence for any such carer or responsible person to ill-treat or willfully neglect a person this includes physical, psychological, financial, domestic, discriminatory and sexual abuse as an offence. And it's quite a big one as well. So it is a tribal either way offence. And as you know, either way means it either goes to the magistrates or you go to the Crown Court. And that depends on the severity of the crime. So if you go through the magistrates, you're looking at uh, six months in prison and or a 12 month fine. And if you go to the Crown Court, which is a big one, you're looking at five years on indictment. So looking after people and vulnerable members of our society is massively important for police officers. And I know some people might be like, oh, wow, shouldn't we be out, you know, catching criminals and all this stuff. But remember what uh, Sir Robert Peel said, that the police are the community and the community are the police and protecting people is a big part of your job. And if you can help make sure that the most vulnerable members of our society are looked after, then you're doing a fantastic job. And you know, you should always strive for empathy, always strive to help other people. And another one of the um, Peelian principles is number nine, which is my favorite, where it's not, you know, it's the absence of crime and stuff on the streets that prove that um, the police are doing a good job not seeing lots of police officers out there arresting people. It's the absence of crime and disorder. So you're doing a fantastic job. Remember to care for other people because we are all human and it doesn't matter whether somebody is having a particularly bad time. It doesn't make them any less human than you are. And for whatever reason they lack mental capacity, they need support not to be dehumanized. I'm gonna talk about a case which is, um, quite hard hitting and terrible, absolutely terrible case. And this was back in the seventies. So we're pre-pace now. And I know that like, when I say pre-pace, I feel like I'm talking about something that was like prehistoric, but it kind of is in terms of the progression that we've made in policing over the last 50 or so years. God, I can't believe the seventies was that long ago. Wow. Anyway, it was in 1975 when this crime happened and it, it shook the nation because it was, horrendous. The crime I'm talking about is the murder of Leslie Susan Moleseed, 11 years old. Um, she was kind of short for her age, very dainty, and she'd gone to the shop to buy some bread and never returned. And back in the 1970s and 80s, you would just go to the shop for your parents. My mum used to send me to the shop to buy her fags when I was a kid. Um, it's all right because that shop's closed down now so they won't get in trouble. Um, yeah, so she'd gone to the shop to buy her bread and she never came home. Obviously they went out searching for her and, and they found Leslie dead she'd been murdered and um, there was like semen on her underwear. So she'd been attacked and murdered. Um, there was one suspect kind of from the off and that was Stefan Kitchko. So Stefan was um, a young guy. He'd just got a job in like a tax collector's office as a clerk. He'd, um, he was picked on at school and picked on at work. He had no friends and he was 
super close to his mum and his auntie. His dad had died previously. He was, um, so he had a, like a, a mental age of around, uh, it, numerous sources say put in between like seven and 11 in terms of his um, mental age. He got a condition called hypogonadism, which means that he'd not fully developed into adulthood. And he was unable to produce semen, which is interesting, isn't it really? Because it was found at the scene. That's just one bit of evidence for you there. Um, so he was kind of the main suspect from the off. And that's because he was kind of dubbed as like, the local odd person, because in terms of the social contract, he acted slightly outside of that, deviated from that because he was different. Just because someone's different doesn't make them a bad person. Could just reiterate that. And so Stefan um, lived with his mom, very close to his mom and auntie, and very socially awkward and shy because he was different to everybody else. And people weren't very nice to him. His family were mega proud of him for having a job and being the first person in their family to wear a tie and go to work in that kind of um, industry. But he was a bit of a you know a social outcast, which is awful for Stefan. So when Leslie was discovered murdered, he was instantly one of the suspects because people had him down as being a little bit weird. And some schoolgirls came out and said, oh yeah, this guy, he, um, he flashed at us. And he didn't, by the way. They just lied to um, for a laugh, apparently. They did come clean eventually that he didn't do that. And the police um, had got it in the head that it was him, even though lots of evidence pointed that it wasn't him. And like I said, this is pre-pace. So what they did is they arrested Stefan and questioned him for a long, long time in police custody. And like I said, this is pre-pace. So they treated him terribly. Um, hours and hours and hours of questioning. And it wasn't the nice question you get now. They didn't just have these conversations. and He didn't have an appropriate adult with him. He was by himself with limited mental capacity. And he was being interrogated and oppressed by the investigating officers. One of the final things they said to him, they got him to sign a confession or admit to it. And they kept saying, you did it, didn't you? You did it, didn't you? Tell us you did it and we'll let you go home. And imagine that for like a long, long time, like days. And yeah, so they said, um, if you tell us you did it, we'll let you go home and see your mum for Christmas. Stefan being close to his mum and being afraid and fed up, admitted to it so he could go home for Christmas. But obviously they lied and he didn't go home for Christmas. Oh no. In fact, he didn't go home for a long, long time. There was also a lot of evidence that pointed away from Stefan Kitchko. So we know he's got hypogonadism. We know that he can't actually produce sperm. Yet they find it on um, little Leslie's clothing. So that's one thing we know he can't do. Um, and in court, it never actually got the doctor's statements never got into court. They didn't use the evidence. They suppressed all the evidence that pointed away from Stefan and only used evidence that would incriminate him. He wasn't even there at the time. It, at the time of the crimes, he was with his mum and his auntie and they'd been seen going to the shop buying flowers to put on his father's grave. So they knew he wasn't there, but they still pursued with this because of their copper's nose, this gut instinct that he is the guy that did it. Okay, remember that. They also ignored a statement from a taxi driver saying that it was him who'd exposed himself to these young girls. They ignored that and they suppressed it, even though that's the basis of what they use for Kitchko's um, conviction for his confession, that he exposed himself and it was him who did the murder. When actually we know it was a taxi driver who exposed himself because he admitted it. It's a statement saying that it wasn't Kitchko. So already we know something's not right here. They knew he'd got limited mental capacity. He asked for his mum to be there and they said no. They didn't even offer him a solicitor or anyone to be present. And after um, making the confession, by the way, Kitchko retracted it. He said he only said it because they said I could see my mum. But they still went to court. Like, this is crazy. This wouldn't happen now, obviously, thank God. Kitchko even said he'd, he'd never met Leslie, let alone killed her. And so imagine if you've been put in prison for... Um, attacking a child and murdering them life it's not going to be um easy is it in jail and it wasn't for kitchko he got attacked numerous times and his mental health deteriorated massively while kitchko was incarcerated his mom was working tirelessly to get him out she was like i know he is innocent he's not done this 
finally after years and years of trying to get herself heard in 1989 they started having a good look at this conviction of Kitchko's and the evidence and stuff around it and four vital things popped up and they were um, the additional unused documentation would have cast doubt on the confession and would have supported as we know Kitchko that's number one number two the girls who said Kitchko had exposed himself to him admitted that they lied. They admitted that they'd just seen um, a taxi driver having a wee behind a bush. And the pathologist had found sperm in the semen stains on Leslie's underwear, which obviously we knew that Kitchko could not produce. And that was number four, that he couldn't produce that. So we know it could not have been him. They know that, 1989. Okay, so he's only been in prison for like, you know, forever. But after all these years painstakingly going through stuff in 1992 so remember he got convicted crime up in 1975 convicted in 1976 it's now 1992 and the appeal is a go okay yep you can appeal it was released immediately it spent nine months in rehab and this is quoted as being the mi biggest miscarriage of justice of all time um he got given well it was supposed to be given £500,000 compensation but his mental and physical health had deteriorated so badly in prison that he died before ever receiving it and his mum died as well so it's an absolutely horrendous story. Uh, one good thing that came out of this is we knew it wasn't Kitchko um, which obviously we know that it was somebody else the murderer was out there somewhere and you know because of this case People with limited mental capacity are being treated better because of other cases as well. But this is the biggest miscarriage of justice of all time. And the flaws in there just show what we could have done if we applied what we do now to help this person, to help Steph and Kitchko and the victim's family get justice. We know now that it was actually Ronald K Street who committed the offence. So he was uh, arrested but not charged with a sex attack in 2005. And they took a sample from him and they ran that sample through the databases and guess what? A direct hit to the um, sample taken from Leslie's um, clothing, Leslie Morsi's clothing. So he'd been free for 31 years and another man had sat in prison in his place. Um, so yeah, he has been obviously arrested now. But yeah, for 31 years he was out attacking other people. And it took 31 years to get justice for Leslie's and Morsi's family and it took 16 years a liberty away from somebody else and ultimately led to him and his mother's early deaths so to avoid all of that what we do is we do proper investigations we look at evidence and if that leads away from an investigation so be it if you have got a suspect and your evidence you think it's this guy i'm telling you it's this guy the evidence says it's this guy you need to look at all the evidence because you do not want to be responsible for all of things like that. It's your job to help try and find the truth. It's not your job to decide who's guilty or not. You find the evidence, you find the truth, and then you take it to the courts. They decide. You've got to make sure that you leave no stone unturned when you're investigating stuff. And you're totally honest and disclose everything. Um, and when people have limited mental capacity or they are vulnerable, they, they have appropriate adults with them that they know that their their rights, that they're looked after properly and they're treated like human beings. Because that's what you would want if you were going through that or somebody you knew was going through that process. That's it from me. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, let me know what you want to cover in the comments. Look after yourselves, look after each other and please don't commit any crimes.